Welcome back. This is Larry Benko, W0QE. This video is a follow-up to video number 101 on attenuators, where I will show how to easily determine if an attenuator is good or has been damaged. I do exactly this when I see an attenuator that I might be interested in purchasing at an electronics flea market. The three attenuator topologies shown in the picture have component values that result from the downloadable SimSmith file of video number 101 and therefore a 50 ohm attenuator with an attenuation of 10 dB. Early in the video there will be some algebra, but there will be a downloadable SimSmith file that does all the calculations for those who don't care about the algebra. I am trying to balance the comments I get about too much versus too little detail. There are many ways to measure these three different attenuator topologies. We can measure them with a VNA, we can measure them with a ohm meter. The assumption here being that the manufacturer who made them knows how to make the components uh, correctly and put them in a case so that the attenuator performs properly. So as a user, you really don't need to know if the what the actual values of these are. These can have slightly these can be slightly inductive, but there can be some compensation internal. It really doesn't matter. So, and we can make measurements that way, but it's a little bit hard to do when you're trying to buy something. An ohm meter is pretty easy to do. If we think about these as being a three terminal device, pin one, pin two, and ground, we can make some measurements very quickly. There's three measurements we can make. Pin one to ground, which is the sum of these two resistors. Pin two to ground, which is the sum of these two resistors. And pin one to pin two is the sum of these two resistors. We get the value if we're assuming a 10 dB attenuator. And these are just, this is attenuator value just picked. Any value would work just fine. It will give us different values here, but I'm trying to show that all of them are exactly the same. We get 61.11 ohms, 51.94 ohms. For the pi attenuator, a little more complicated, but not too much. Pin 1 to ground is these two resistors in series, that combination in parallel with this resistor. Again, 61.11 ohms, same for P2 to ground. From P1 to P2, it's these two resistors in series in parallel with this resistor. Again, 51.94. For the bridge T, which is less common, the bridge T's claim to fame is the fact that two of the resistors are 50 ohms in it. And sometimes it gives us nicer values to use. But um, in, the bridge, in the bridge T case, we can think of these two resistors for pin one to ground. We think of these two resistors as being in series as one value. That's in parallel with 50 ohms, and then plus the 23.12 ohms as shown in the, the equation here. Again, 61.11 ohms, P12, a little bit different. It's 50 plus 50, which is 100 in parallel with 108, and that gives us 51.94. From an outward perspective, all three of these attenuator types are exactly the same. You don't really care what's in your attenuator. If somebody claims it's a 10 dB attenuator, you can make these measurements, P1 to ground, P2 to ground, and P1 to P2 and determine whether or not that attenuator is good, whether it's bad, whether some component value has been heated up too much and changed in value. Now we will take the three values that we measured, P12, P1G, P2G. Of course, in this case, they're calculated values and your values will be different. But we'll take those values and we need to solve for the components in some topology of an attenuator. The T attenuator is the easiest one to do. If we look at the T attenuator real quickly, we see P12 is R1 plus R3, as shown here. P1G would be R1 plus R2, and P2G would be R2 plus R3. Here's three equations and three unknowns. Unfortunately, we want these in terms of R1, R2, and R3, so we do some algebra. We take two of the equations, we subtract one from the other, we eliminate one of the variables, one of the R values, we substitute it back into the a third equation, and we can get R1 equals this, and then likewise with another substitution, we get R2 equals this, and R3 equals this, and ultimately, what we have when we're all done, and we substitute the measured values back in, is we see that R1 is 25.97 ohms, R2 is 35.14, and R3 is 29.97 ohms. Here's a SimSmith file, which does all the calculations we did in the previous couple slides. Anytime I produce a SimSmith file, that has something displayed here. Click on it, and then show notes block, and there'll be a description of how the file works or any other details that might be important. And this should aid in terms of understanding how the file works. In this case, we have two things to do. The first thing we're gonna do is take an ideal attenuator, 
per your specifications, 10 dB and 50 ohms in this case, build an ideal T network out of it. From those values we have for the ideal T network, we are going to then convert those into the measured values P1G, P2G, and P12. And these are the numbers you would need to, keep, to, to compare to if you were going to make some measurements on an attenuator. You might do this for a 10 dB attenuator, for a 6 dB attenuator, maybe for a 20 dB attenuator. We can see that these values are different. So pick the different values, make a little table, take a multimeter with you when you're looking to buy an attenuator, and if the numbers are close, then you're probably pretty confident that the attenuator is good. Make sure that physically, that physically the housing's good and the connectors inside, the pins and stuff inside the connectors are good. But if that's the case, uh, you're probably good to go. On the other hand, if the measurements aren't good here and they're off by a bit, it means either the, a resistor is bad or maybe just been heated up too much and its value has changed. You can still gut the insides of an attenuator, put your own circuit in, and I do that all the time. I put uh, filters inside of atten old attenuator circuits, and the uh, housing acts as a very nice enclosure. In this case, though, for the attenuator, you can get an idea for how close you need to be for, for these values by taking this circuit. This circuit takes the measured values and converts them back to a T equivalent. Again, your, T, your network does not need to be a T network. But remember, they're all equivalent if you, if you uh, convert them back and forth correctly. So in this case, instead of the 61.11, 51.95, and 61.11, I measured 61, 53.5, 62.5. What does that give us? Well, there's two things we can do. The first thing is we can just read some values off from up here. It shows a 10.2 dB attenuator and one, a 0 dBW source minus 10.2 dBW output, so 10.2 dB attenuator. This only has one decimal place of accuracy, so that might be good enough. It might not be good enough. In this case, down here, I just chose to, act, to do it with a little more accuracy. In the case of SWR, we can read SWR up here, looking this direction, 1.029 to 1. This direction, come, going backwards, I calculated it here. It's SWR of LG1.REVZ, and it's 1.002. We could also look at it on a square chart. On a square chart, the attenuation, the output power shows 10 point, shows 10.2 down here, but really it's 10.15 we can see on the graph. So it's 10.15 dB attenuator. We can look at the SWR looking in this direction, 1.029. We can look at the SWR going back this way, 1.002. And again, um, the ideal attenuator, of course, is going to be right. It's going to be 10 dB loss. The, attenu the SWR looking in, of course, is going to be 1 to 1. And the SWR looking back this direction will be, of course, 1 to 1 also. Uh, this attenuator isn't really too bad, and it's probably good enough for your needs. If you like this video, give me a thumbs up. Feel free to make comments, suggestions for future videos. There will be more.